Groß Deutsche Reichstag, Berlin, 2014. The lights in the secure compartmentalized facility were low, adding a conspiratorial air to the meeting. Amongst the assembled in the room were the most powerful members of the German parliament. The chancellor himself was notably absent. One wall was almost entirely occupied by video displays, which were all currently showing muted news broadcasts from the various state-approved networks. All of them were covering the same stories. Continued riots in German-administered Britain. Granting them any semblance of autonomy was a mistake. Like a cancer, our weakness has spread from France to Britain and who knows where next. The speaker was a heavy-set man, not particularly liked by his peers, but Vreni Walter had strong ties to the military, which made him an important part of this unofficial committee. Helma Schneider tried her best not to curl her nose as she addressed the rotund legislator. She was seated close to him and could smell the unwashed stink of the man. How his wife or his many mistresses tolerated his physical advances were beyond her, but she tried to push her personal distaste away for the sake of progress. The British problem is only a symptom of a deeply rooted illness within the Reich itself. Years ago, I was at one of this group's first meetings, and we were warned back then of what was coming. The man who delivered that warning was summarily shot not four days later. I hope that the gravity of this situation we're now facing will sober and ground our attitudes on criticism moving forward. Gentlemen, the Reich is dying. Years ago, such a statement would have been received with shock by those assembled, and anyone who dared utter such a sentiment was taking their lives into their own hands. But the ongoing British riots had been a sobering wake-up call to many within the highest levels of German government. The writing was on the wall. It had been for decades. I do not disagree completely with our father's vision for Germany, but we must face cold, hard facts. The quest for German purity has failed. Birth rates are at their lowest levels since the establishment of the Reich. Entire suburbs across Germany are becoming ghost towns. The Reich's scientific achievement simply cannot keep pace with the United States and its allies. Our industry stagnates. Our culture wanes. Our international friends are few. Rupert Fell, the legislator with ties to the Reich's propaganda department, shook his head vigorously. These are temporary problems. We simply need to rethink the way we implement our cultural program. No, Mr. Feld, these are systemic problems, and it's time we face the truth. Helma made it a point to hold the man's gaze until he shrunk from her stare. Around the room, others avoided her eyes as well. We have believed our own lies for too long. Uwe Schmidt was, in Helma's opinion, one of the most level-headed legislators in the room. He had grown up and occupied India, far from the Reich's center of power, and thus had been largely immune to its propaganda. This gave him a grounded perspective Helma had grown to appreciate, and the two had become fast allies. Afghanistan and Venezuela continue to drain American resources. Our influence operations within America have stoked the discontent of war weariness. We have bought ourselves some room to maneuver. If we're to take drastic action, then the time for such an opportunity is running short. The room went quiet. It was Helma who broke the silence. We all know the Chancellor will not take necessary actions. There are certain members of the Parliament who will likewise be unhelpful if we're to right what's been set wrong. Mr. Schmidt and I have created a list of those we believe will be supportive and those we believe will be problematic. Uva reached into his briefcase and carefully entered a combination into the digital lock. Inside, he removed 13 manila folders, one each for the members of the unofficial committee. In the final printout are individuals who will have to be removed from their positions. Their views will not align with ours at all. The men were silent for a minute as they reviewed the lists inside the respective folders. Many nodded in agreement. The group was of a like mind, but there remained one question. It was Verney Walter who asked it. And what about the Chancellor? Uva was prepared. He'll face trial for crimes against the Reich for allowing its decline. We have evidence prepared and judges ready. The trial will be quick, naturally, to avoid giving the public time to react. Within 48 hours, he'll be found guilty and officially stripped of power. For his apprehension, though, we'll need the cooperation of the military, Mr. Walter. Walter nodded slowly. The normally cocksure man was unusually silent, his mind making careful calculations. The gravity of what was being proposed weighed heavily on all assembled. Up until this point, every member of the committee, save for Schmidt and Schneider, could claim some level of innocent ignorance. When Walter spoke next, he spoke very carefully. Yes, I believe we could succeed at all goals presented. The pressure in the room increased. Now there was no denial for anyone involved. If they were discovered, there would be no chance of pleading innocence. However, there's still the matter of the chancellery itself. Uva nodded, knowingly. I believe we can all agree there's only one natural fit for the position. Mrs. Schneider is well liked by the people and trusted by them. They'll need a familiar, friendly face to 
eased the transition. Uva's response was as much that had occurred today pre-planned. Halma carefully studied each member of the committee, making mental note of those who immediately nodded in agreement and who hesitated. She made especially careful note of those whose jaws she saw quietly clench, lips pursed slightly. But in the end, none raised an objection, just as she'd planned, years of careful maneuvering spreading her influence amongst the Reich's citizens without ever truly eclipsing that of the Chancellor himself and thus putting a target on her back. She'd even volunteered to take on messaging for the ongoing crisis of terrorism in the occupied territories of the Middle East and Chinese border regions at a time when national outrage had ended the career of every politician before her who tried. Her careful messaging and ability to manipulate information to place the blame firmly on the Americans had only increased her popularity and prepared them for the confrontation she knew was inevitable if the Reich was to survive. Though none objected, Helma remembered those who had remained uncomfortably silent. Once the ball was rolling, in all the chaos it would be easy for their careers or lives to meet a similar end to the Chancellor's. Camp David, Maryland Despite it being winter, the heated pool was kept at comfortable 86 degrees all times. When the President of the United States lifted himself out of it and into the bitter cold air, his body steamed furiously. He was quickly offered multiple towels and a thick warm robe by several aides whom he shooed away with great annoyance. He didn't even bother drying, but simply wrapped the rope around himself as he began the short trek to the main lodge. William Michaels, his national security advisor, fell lockstep in with him along with several other aides, who were all having hushed but fervent phone conversations on their cell phones. What I want to know is, is how the hell we were blindsided like this? We've had the Reich penetrated for decades and you're telling me nobody got wind of this? Michaels shook his head as he kept to the pace with the president who was still steaming in the bitterly cold Maryland winter air, a fitting visual given the president's unusually angry state. The conspirators must have been keeping this a tight secret from their own intelligence services, including the party security apparatus. There would have been few opportunities to sniff this one out. The president halted in angry surprise. You're telling me that even the party had no clue this was coming? Michael shook his head once more. Every source we've got has been telling us the same thing. They were blindsided. Everyone was blindsided. They kept this under real close wraps. Seems only a few senior members of the military and key commands throughout the Reich were in on it too. The plot had very well-placed support. The president began marching again. Michaels and the aides struggled to keep up. The main lodge of Camp David was swarming like a beehive that had just had a stone thrown into it, and the Secret Service team responsible for interior security replaced the team responsible for exterior security. Only a few hand-picked guards continued along. Those the president liked best and now shadowed him wherever he went. There were no other guests at Camp David on this retreat. The president had been hoping for a quiet weekend getaway, a quick trip to recharge. Nevertheless, the army of aides, bureaucrats, and liaisons that followed the president wherever he went had filled the place, and while they normally mostly kept to their rooms, the stunning news coming out of Germany had created a frenzy of activity. Military liaisons were coordinating with the Joint Chiefs and various other military and intelligence officials, while federal bureaucrats were overseeing responses by dozens of various agencies that made up the United States government. There would be no specific direction yet, not until the President gave it, but the United States was determined not to get caught flat-footed. General Thomas Breckinridge fell into the President's retinue as they marched to his personal quarters so he could change into something more appropriate. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs had come at the President's invitation, an opportunity to relax. The President swore that just a half hour ago the man had been in shorts and a t-shirt and headed for the squash court, and in what must have been no more than a few minutes, the barrel-chested man who oversaw the entirety of the United States military had changed into an impeccably pressed uniform, as if he'd been wearing it all day. Thomas, you better not be bringing me any bad news. The President looked like he meant it moving fast enough down the main hall of the resort that he was bordering on a jog. We've got reports of increased military activity along the Palestinian border, but birds haven't seen any major buildup of forces in days prior, so I'm very confident they're simply posturing to match what our own increased security response is bound to be. The Geber line seems to be a flurry of activity, but the Germans have always known that this was their weakest front. They're likely simply trying to counter any attempt by us to capitalize on the chaos. The Geber Line marked the boundary between Free Algeria, a U.S. ally, and the Nazi-occupied Northern Sahara territories in the wake of World War II. It had been the site of ferocious fighting during the brief two-week war, with the flat desert landscape heavily favoring German tanks. They had outperformed America's fleet of M60s so thoroughly 
that its replacement, the Abrams, had been rushed into production in a cycle of ongoing innovation. It had been incredibly pricey to rush a prototype tank into production and engineer fixes or upgrades later on, but many agreed the modern Abrams could outshoot and outfight anything the Nazis could bring to the table. The two-week ground war defeats, however, had pushed the Geber line several miles west, earning the Germans a slightly larger slice of Algeria and prompting a mass exodus by the local population from cities and villages that were suddenly on the wrong side of the border. Given the indefensibility of the terrain, it had made sense that the Germans were scrambling to move into a protective posture. Both sides had massive military forces in the area, which could begin combat operations within half a day at most of receiving orders. That's the first bit of good news I've heard in the last 10 minutes. I want you to keep us at DEFCON 3, but move local forces to heightened readiness. Nothing that'll spook the Germans. And get Berlin on the hotline, let them know we're simply matching. We won't start shooting unless they do. The general confirmed the president's order and removed himself from the group right as they got to the president's private room. Here, the rest of the gaggle dispersed to the adjoining halls but remained close. The president opened the door, and before slamming it shut behind him to change into more appropriate attire and handle the crisis that had interrupted his weekend, he turned once more to Michaels. And for God's sake, let's try to find out what the hell is going on in Germany and what they might do next. A $300 billion intelligence budget and our best source is fucking German state news. The door slammed shut with great force, just inches from Michael's face. Northern Chinese occupied Russian border. The drone wasn't nearly as stealthy as its American counterpart, but it was low observable and small enough to remain undetected by the Chinese air defense radars. The remoteness of the border region only made the probability of discovery even lower, and the ruggedness of the terrain made the threat of invasion improbable enough to warrant only a few border posts on the Chinese side. Likewise, the Germans manned only a token number of outposts, though unlike the Chinese, their problems were more about a lack of available manpower. The occupied Russian Far East, like most of the territory past the Urals, had never truly been integrated into the Reich, making it a bit of a frozen Wild West. There were outposts of civilization here, though, massive mining and refining colonies built by the Germans. These were lucrative targets to the stream of insurgents and terrorists that regularly poured over the Chinese border to strike at them. The Reich had complained for decades to the Chinese government, but the truth is the vast size of the border itself and the ruggedness of the terrain made it near impossible for the Chinese to actually police it, and not that they particularly wanted to. The Chinese Democratic People's Party was a close ally of the United States, and like most liberal governments of the world, disgusted by the Reich's long history of abuses and atrocities. It was why the US and Chinese intelligence apparatus regularly worked to train supply and support the various groups seeking to cross the border and attack German interests. The drone focused its camera on the small group of trucks, approximately 1,500 feet below it. The thermal camera cut through the cover of night, which made the extreme high-definition camera useless at the moment. But the idling engines of the trucks and the men's own body heat below them were all the drone needed to home in on them. Several thousand miles away, the data stream for the drone was being monitored by German operators and decision makers. After observing the men below unloading boxes of what closely matched containers of American Javelin anti-tank missiles, the order was given. The group of men worked without care. They all knew the real danger was when they crossed the border. They allowed the engines on the vehicles to idle, none of the men cherishing the thought of climbing back into a freezing vehicle once the work was done. Staff Sergeant Patrick Johnson of the 75th Ranger Regiment was technically only here to show the new Delta Force guys the ropes. Compared to other operations, this was a pure milk run a meet and greet between the two new Deltas and Orvacheks, the slang term for the ethnic Russian and Mongolian fighters who regularly undertook cross-border raids into German-held territory. Johnson couldn't help but admire the Russians. They'd been fighting to liberate their nation for the better part of a century at this point. The Mongolians likewise had a bone to pick with the Germans, and the Reich had seized part of its oil-rich northernmost territories in a border dispute in the late 90s. In hindsight, Johnson knew he'd fucked up. He'd gotten complacent, mostly because Germany had never dared retaliate across the Chinese border. But meeting out in the open, keeping engines idling, and taking no measures to control their thermal signatures were all wildly against protocol. The first Faust Mark II air-to-surface missile exploded dead center in the formation of the vehicles, riding the drone's target designation laser with pinpoint accuracy. The others struck a few meters away. Luckily for Johnson, a truck had been in between him and both blasts though he'd still have to hump it two days back to civilization 
with multiple fractured ribs and a serious concussion, most of that distance crawling on his hands and knees. The Deltas were caught in the blast and wiped out, along with most of the fighters. Johnson would attempt to triage the few survivors despite his own wounds, but realized that there was no way of saving any of them without guaranteeing his own death in return. The army would give him a medal for his heroic fight for survival, but the loss of multiple fingers to frostbite would ensure an early retirement. Johnson never hung that medal up. He tossed it the moment he was clear of the ceremony. He had known better and gotten a lot of people killed because he got complacent. Hong Kong, China Sun Ning didn't need to take these meetings anymore. She had people for that now. She was the president's most trusted foreign advisor, with eyes on a future run for office herself. But diplomacy was about relationships, and some relationships could shape the fate of nations. The restaurant hadn't changed much in the years that she'd been coming, except the hidden microphones and cameras had gotten much more sophisticated and were now Chinese-made, a symbol of China's ascension to the world stage and increasing technological independence from the United States. The more that China changed, though, the more Ning appreciated the deep love for tradition of the Chinese people. The technology advanced, but ways of life and restaurants remained largely the same. Fitting for the world's oldest civilization, it was comforting. She'd expected the senior diplomat to arrive late. She had once years ago. In the diplomatic world, there were no accidents, only strategically calculated moves. But Ning was surprised to see the German woman arrive on time a mere minute after Ning's own arrival at their usual table. Selma Krauss exchanged the usual pleasantries, as was customary. To outside observers, they were two old friends meeting for a meal. But there was no love lost between the two women, whose words shaped the path of their two nations in Asia and beyond. The waiter, a Chinese intelligence agent, lightly touched the back of the German diplomat's chair as he left after taking their order. She appeared not to notice, and Ning was pleased. That brief touch had deposited a miniature listening device developed by the Americans, which was no larger than a large flea, and would cling to the diplomat's clothing the moment she leaned back in her chair. The small corner of the restaurant afforded them privacy from the general dining area, and once she was satisfied the wait staff were out of earshot, Krauss broke the silence. I seem to recall warning you that relying on the Americans would be a mistake. Ning didn't blink at the veiled threat. Violating Chinese sovereignty and murdering 15 people was a mistake, Miss Krauss. You killed two Americans and can offer no proof of weapon smuggling. I think you'll find that it was you who made the mistake. The diplomat seemed unfazed by the retaliatory threat. We warned you repeatedly about the border attacks. We warned you about tightening security after the radiological attacks seven years ago. We've been nothing but patient with China, Miss Singh. I think you have underestimated the consequences of that patience running out. Singh tilted her head despite herself. This was the most overt threat any representative of the Reich had ever delivered. I hope your new chancellor has the sense to remember the promise of CETO's Article 5. The Southeast Asian Treaty Organization was the world's most successful military and political alliance, spanning North America and much of Western Asia, uniting most of the world's most powerful political, economic, and military powers. The entire organization, however, was carefully balanced around a single point of failure. Article 5. An attack on one was an attack on all. If that promise failed, the faith that bound together the Allied powers, who more often than not had diverging interests, might falter. A single stumble could cause diplomatic waves around the world, dramatically changing the balance of power as CETO and its members' promises to other nations were cast into doubt. Krauss calmly slipped from her ice water but never responded. Instead, she gathered her things and wished Singh a pleasant evening. Gulf of Oman the pair of F-18s swung low, buzzing the German destroyers with barely a hundred feet of clearance. The roar of the afterburning engines were a clear warning, but the ships were undeterred. The American pilots themselves knew that they were being targeted by the surface group's air defense radars and more beyond from shore-based air defense batteries manned by Iranians. All it would take is one itchy trigger finger to hurl the world into a true catastrophe. The destroyers deployed boarding parties on fast attack boats. Under cover of the big ships, the Kriegsmarine special boarding action sailors climbed onto the Chinese-flagged container and cargo ships that the German Surface Action Group had ordered to halt under threat of attack. The ship's captains would be temporarily arrested and control over the ship handed over to the Kriegsmarine, who would sail them back to German-held ports along the Iranian coast. The order for a complete energy blockade of China had been given just that morning. And now, all across the Persian and Oman Gulfs, German Navy vessels moved to impound Chinese-flagged ships. Merchant vessels in other countries such as Bermuda 
were allowed to continue as normal, but in the future, they would be denied entry into the Persian Gulf by a sizable German fleet for as long as they were contracted to carry oil and gas destined for China. The crews of the Chinese vessels would be released as soon as their ships were safely in Iranian ports, where the Iranians would provide transportation back home. The ships themselves would be either held under impound or simply reflagged and repurposed by the Reich. Two American carrier strike groups loitered 100 nautical miles from the mouth of the Persian Gulf, their crews fully prepared for action against the boarding German ships. However, no such order came. Fearing a rapid escalation, the American president instead opted to attempt diplomacy first. The real crisis would come a day later. Egypt had been allowed a token of independence, despite being surrounded on both sides by German-occupied territories. At 0300 hours the next morning, that independence came to an end with a massive air assault of Cairo, followed hours later by a huge column of German combat vehicles streaming out of Palestine. With the capital under control, Germany closed the Suez Canal to all Chinese shipping. This, combined with an energy embargo of German energy products and the seizing of Chinese vessels operating in the Persian Gulf, caused an economic disaster in China. The nation relied on imports from the region for half of its energy needs. And even with America rapidly expanding production over the next several months, it would take years for U.S. oil exports to fulfill China's needs. The Chinese economy came to a crashing halt, then a deep recession and eventual contraction. The new German chancellor reinforced the Russian Far East with multiple Wehrmacht divisions and an expansion in air and missile bases. The American president would opt for diplomacy over confrontation, though in the years to come many would question the attempt to find a diplomatic solution with the German Reich. Now go check out how this all started with What If Hitler Won World War II 1950s, or click this other video instead.